It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, General Mahoney. General Chris Mo Mahoney is the 37th Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. He is a naval aviator who has commanded at the squadron, group, and wing levels. As a general officer, his duties have included service as Deputy Commander, Marine Forces Pacific, Director of Strategy and Plans at Headquarters Marine Corps, Deputy Commander, U.S. Forces Japan, and Deputy Commandant for Programs and Resources, Headquarters Marine Corps. He assumed his current duties as Assistant Commandant on November 3rd, 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, the 37th Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Mo Mahoney. Ray, hey, thanks for that. And once again, thanks to the sponsors. It's great to see uh, Pete Daly, albeit in perhaps a different, more relaxed role. Uh, Pete, I'll get right after it uh, so that I don't run the clock out uh, and we have time to have some, some give and take. Uh, it's always a great pleasure to come here for Naval Institute uh, events, regardless of what they are. So I'm, I'm truly uh, humbled, Ray, for you bringing me up here. And I hope you're enjoying your new position. <laughs> Today, look, I want to provide my perspective. You heard some of the jobs that I've had. I've spent a lot of time uh, in the Pacific on, on naval, uh, naval strategy, primarily focused on force structure, to get after uh, and answer the question, just not respond to it. We, as you know, uh, are a maritime nation. We rely now, as we have uh, throughout our history, on Navy and expeditionary forces, Marine forces for self-defense and the preservation uh, of our way of life. So not just defending what we value, but uh, protecting how we do it. Our naval force structure is not just a Department of the Navy issue in that regard. It's, it's a national issue. In fact, you know, I don't think I'm stretching the bow too far. It's not overly dramatic uh, to argue that the composition of our fleet from end to end, uh, our ability to plan, to budget, to build and maintain that fleet is more uh, than a national issue when you compare that with our strategy. Uh, it's a direct reflect, reflection of our commitment uh, to defend uh, a world order that we brought up and matured. So we have departmental exigencies, we have national exigencies, and I would argue we have global exigencies directly tied to the force structure of the fleet. It's critical that we get this more right uh, than wrong, uh, the insinuation there being that we've got a lot of things right, but let's work on getting it more right, not only for ourselves, but as I alluded to, for the preservation of international trade, security, uh, and prosperity. Last week, I was in Simi Valley uh, at the Reagan National Defense Forum. I had the, I had the great pleasure and fortune to share a stage uh, with, with one of the, uh, the titans uh, of leadership, uh, Admiral Aquilino, the commander of Indo-PACOM. And on that panel, we discussed our national defense strategy as it interleaves or as it relates to competition, specifically techno-competition with China. As a setup to that panel uh, out there in Simi Valley, as you might know, the Reagan Forum puts out a survey uh, to the American public, different demographics, pretty, pretty large survey. And in it, they ask for a side-by-side -side comparison uh, with capabilities with China. When they compared US naval forces, they asked the question, compare US naval forces and capabilities to Chinese naval forces and capabilities. The U.S. Naval for Forces received very, 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 very high marks. In fact, 50%, 57% of Americans polled believe the U.S. Navy maintains superiority over the PLAN, over the Chinese Navy, 57%. Uh, as far as our naval superior, superiority goes, uh, I agree globally. There is no force on Earth, and this, this isn't cheerleading, that can do what the sea services do. And all you have to do is read the paper or look at a map to realize how true that is. But yes, there are, but, and there is always a but, it is critical that we are critical when it comes to these assessments. 
that we don't ride on the assessments and assume them to be true. In fact, I think if you look deeply into that assessment, I'm a bit more pessimistic. We can't allow the non-critical factor to be a force in our force structure development and our strategy de development going forward. The, the critical look at what we do, how we do it, how we plan and budget for it has to take the form. If we are ahead, as the assessment suggests, in areas like joint and combined interoperability, which I believe we are, we need to keep the pedal down. We need to keep accelerating. That's a snapshot in time. If we want to be ahead next week, next year, we have to continue to accelerate. In areas where we're equal, where there's parity perhaps, or where we're behind, areas like shipbuilding, uh, we need to take a hard look at how we get better and get better faster. We need to look critically at how our strategy and our structure apply to our ability first to deter, so we don't have to fight, and when the fight comes, that we can win not just globally in a general sense, but at a specific place, at a specific time, to bring the capabilities uh, to prevail. Most importantly, any assessment, whether it's formal or informal, whether it's scientific or otherwise, can't diminish the sense of urgency that is right now. The Secretary of the Navy spoke at Harvard a few months ago, maybe some of you saw that, and what he said is really of significance to what we're talking about today. In his remarks, he talked about the warships that the PLAN has today, some 300, depending on how you count, over 370, let's just leave it there. Uh, ships and submarines, to include aircraft carriers, in the Indo-Pacific with a handful that are uh, based out of Djibouti. I agree with our secretary that the PLAN represents a formal challenge. And for the purposes of what we're talking about today, it's because they're building more ships faster than we can keep pace. Our battle force inventory is consistently adjusting, but suffice it to say, according to the Con Congressional Research Service, uh, they reported our battle force inventory, inventory out at 291 last month. The PLAN is likely to have over 450 ships, 450 uh, ships and submarines by 2030. In this battle force inventory, they're, they're likely to have five carriers, five aircraft carriers. And it isn't just our assessment of this that matters. Addressing this forum in 2020, Mark Milley, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said that the U.S. Navy will have to significantly increase the size of its fleet. Got a soldier saying that the Navy needs to significantly increase the size of its fleet. Why? To defeat, uh, excuse me, to deter China in the future. So he, like what I just alluded to, the snapshot in time, you've got to look forward. More specifically, and I'm quoting here, he said, we're going to have to have a much larger fleet than we have today if we're serious, if we're serious about great power competition and deterring great power war. Once you consider the home field advantage that China has in the first island chain, the problem, the issue, in my mind, becomes more acute. Taiwan Strait is only about 80 miles wide. Um, and it's approximately, depending on what speed you steam at, at least 11 steaming days from the West Coast to get to a point of uh, relevance near the first island chain. Look, I, I, would, I would pit our carrier strike groups, surface action groups, amphibious ready groups, and submarines against anyone in the world. But as we remember, and what we used to say about the USSR, uh, quantity's got a quality all its own. A relative naval combat power analysis in and around the first island chain, near our friends, the Chinese, where they operate with over 370 combatants or ships in their fleet, is not trending in our favor. The bottom line is this problem cannot be solved by the Department of the Navy alone. It isn't meant as a criticism. It's meant as a call for advocacy, advocacy for resourcing the Navy to what we need not to what we think we can manage. Advocacy for an enterprise solution, an end-to-end -end solution to what is an American and a rules-based order issue, as I alluded to. More broadly, it's advocacy for a larger conversation about what our sea services need to preserve our place as the security guarantor in the global commons. Today, 
we find ourselves confronting a challenge of our own making. The size and shape of our naval force is not by accident, and it didn't happen overnight. Nor are the deficiencies of that force a matter of dereliction or incompetence, not at all. Over the last 30 years, our nation optimized our defense and the defense structure for a very different security environment, point blank. The peace dividend following the Cold War, if you want to call it that, and the global war on terror shaped the way we structured the joint force, and rightly so. The department's focus rightly turned to supporting sustained land combat operations. But our priorities have changed, as they should have, as the world has changed to meet the changes in the security landscape. In 1974, Stansfield Turner asked, hey, have things changed so much that we need to change the structure of our force to, to address it. fundamental structural changes. And I would argue that if you look at the 2022 NDS, uh, the answer to Stanfield Turner's 70, 1974 question right now is yes. The demands of great power competition in an increasingly shaky international security environment, to use a technical term, ha have simply altered the calculus for our for force structure and its requirements. Simply, simply put. We need more naval and marine capabilities forward now. For this reason, General Neller testified that the Marine Corps of 2019 was not manned, trained, or equipped for the demands of operational environment against a peer threat. And for that same reason, General Berger embarked on a transformational modernization of the force uh, for our Marine Corps. Today, Commandant Smith is continuing to implement that vision. Now, you can call it what you want. You can come at it from different perspectives. But the bottom line is, if the security environment has changed, if the character of that security environment has changed, and the tasks with, we, with which we have to perform within that environment change, you have to adjust to it. That, to me, in the simplest sense, is what we're talking about. I know that our shipmates in the Navy, uh, including the CNO, feel the same way and the same sense of urgency. I know that as the Navy modernizes, they will face similar headwinds and inertia that we have faced in the Marine Corps. Frankly speaking, in the Marine Corps, change is hard. Uh, but changing naval and marine force structure to meet the demands of our strategy, and we have to do it at speed, but I can tell you, we're not likely to succeed on our own. We need an enterprise solution to this immense challenge, which has become greater than the internal capabilities of the Department of the Navy to solve on its own. That's my thesis. Our Navy needs more resources, plain and simple. And if our department's budget remains flat or decreasing, we, want, we must make the difficult choices uh, during a critical time. We have to choose, choose to invest in a fleet that gives our nation the assurance of winning at the time and place that we choose. We need to choose before our investments, or lack thereof, make the choice for us. It's not simply a resourcing challenge. It's a shipbuilding challenge. It's a whole of government challenge. And every minute we don't act is a minute lost. Can't get it back. Last year during his testimony, uh, Admiral Gilday spoke to distinct challenges our defense industrial face, faces every day to preserve and employ a workforce capable of meeting our requirements. I couldn't agree more. Insufficiencies in our defense industrial base are severely, severely impacting readiness in the global coverage of naval and marine forces. As we speak, our ability to provide our new support to the combatant commanders is consistently falling short. Can't put enough out there. Five out of the last six ARGMU formations uh, were delayed and did not meet their deployment schedule. With gaps in our ARGMU coverage, we are severely reducing the, combat, the combatant commander's options. And really, that's what we're there to provide. I don't want to sound like I'm only concerned about the Marine Corps. This is a naval problem. Every platform, every ship, every submarine's readiness is a matter for national concern. Fluctuations in demand from the DOD, restricted capacity of our shipyards, the limitations that are now ingrained in our domestic shipbuilding enterprise, each diminish our ability to support our national defense strategy. Fixing this will not be easy, and we must meet the challenge with a sense of urgency. Resources, and most importantly, the ingenuity to overcome it is what's required. But our domestic shipbuilding industry, both commercial and military, is a vulnerability we cannot ignore. The U.S. Uh, has witnessed a precipitous decline in our, world, in, a, in our ability to produce ships since World War II. And I read an article the other day that really snapped me to reality. By some estimates, we build about 2.2% 2, 2 
of the world's commercial ships by gross tonnage. 0.2%, I'm not, that, that's a small number. While our shipbuilding capacity has de declined, uh, our, our requirements globally have gone up. So we have an inverse proportionality relationship there. Our allies and partners are identified in our national strategy as a source of asymmetric advantage. If we do not have domestic capacity on its own to produce the fleet that we need at scale and at speed, what about our allies? AUKUS has started to chart a path for increased shipbuilding capacity in Australia. South Korea and Japan's combined shipbuilding capacity rivals China's. Even the European ship capacity, uh, shipbuilding capacity outstrips our own. Our allies, they host our troops. We will fight alongside our allies in combat. Why would we not empower them by inviting them to help us build and maintain our ships, invest in our shipbuilding? Representative Moulton, who I think will, will speak here today, argued last week that expanded shipbuilding and ship repair uh, capacity, specifically talked about Australia, uh, supports deterrence. Representative Whitman, who I think also will be on the stage, uh, highlighted that China has 23.2 million ton shipbuilding capacity versus 23.2 million versus 100,000 ton shipbuilding capacity for the United States. We need to better integrate our allies and partners to bring about real conventional deterrence. In the private sector, companies like Toyota build vehicles in the United States. I drive one, 2001 Tacoma, it's a good truck. They invested more than $8 billion in US manufacturing operations last year alone. We should encourage our allies to make similar investments in our commercial shipbuilding. We would absolutely need the help of Congress, clearly. But I think the magnitude of the challenge requires us to scrutinize any policies that diminish our ability to produce more than the five or so heavy tonnage commercial ships that, that we've been building since about the 1980s. You may hear more about that later. I also think the military can help, but maybe, maybe not in the way that you think. Each year, the Marine Corps alone separates 20 to 30,000 Marines, sends them back to the civilian world. When they go, some go to school, some go into business, and a lot go into the trades. We need a national plan to incentivize our youth to work in the shipbuilding industry, focus those trades on the shipbuilding industry. We've made great strides over the years, and I've visited uh, Connecticut, Virginia, and Mississippi to build out the labor force. However, this is a national imperative. We can be part of the solution if the Navy and the Marine Corps similarly prioritize and incentivize our departing sailors and Marines to pursue the trades that support you, but community pro parochialisms uh, often lead us to believe that one specific platform or ship or aircraft uh, is critical to building the warfighting advantage. My last uh, tactical flight was in an F-35C, so that will clearly solve our national problems. <laughs> Only if I'm in it. <laughs> the thing is, look, mo most of the time, the sum of the capabilities and capacities of multiple platforms, when you add them up, they're greater than each, each one of them alone. No big surprise there. What we need to guard jealously, and what, what really hammered it home for me out at Reagan, is that what we have that most others do not is an ingrained team fight mentality. Call it jointness, call it enterprise mentality, but that's something that we need to guard. All elements of the joint force need to complement each other. We need to build that way. They should reinforce the strengths of each other and importantly protect each other uh, against weaknesses. We have the most capable naval force with the most capable ships and the world's most capable sailors and, machine and marines. I see it every day. Our Navy possesses the most survivable element of the nuclear triad and resource in Colombia has got to remain a top priority for the nation. Our CSGs are the most capable warfighting formation to have existed on the planet in its history. Our amphibious ready groups and amphibious warships remain a true Swiss army knife for our combatant commanders. They bring a hospital, they bring a restaurant, a hotel, a gas station, an airport, an arms warehouse, a marina, and a battalion of angry Marines, all on mobile and maneuverable sovereign US soil. A statutorily mandated risk assessed minimum of 31 L-class ships is the minimum structural foundation to provide that flexibility and those capabilities 
to the combatant commanders. And history, recent history, is replete with examples where the naval team was able to respond because of those attributes I talked about. And when they weren't there, they could not limited the options. And our response, in my mind, uh, was suboptimal, either in time or capability. Going back to the maintenance argument, you can have a 100 of anything, but if they're not available, you got zero. So back to the maintenance argument, we have to ensure the availability of those capable ships, those capable sailors, those capable Marines. There is no substitute that is as flexible as that naval force. Additionally, going forward, we need to get after the 80 versus 8,000 mile tyranny of distance. And one of the answers to that is at least a two-tiered approach to global positioning, a terrestrial approach where we have stores forward in places where we have access and basing. And I think most people here are familiar with the late uh, EDCA deals that we have, what we do in Australia and my whole old home turf, Japan, to have terrestrial stocks forward to destroy that 8,000-mile vulnerability. But importantly, we need maritime positioning stocks that once again, by virtue of being afloat, are resilient and maneuverable and can show up in places where otherwise other people could not. Critical. That said, cruisers, destroyers, oilers, survey ships, mine sweepers, manned and unmanned aviation, preferably manned, each community is uh, it's critical to our overall lethality. I go back to the teaming aspect. I go back to interleaving the joint capabilities. We must, for the Marine Corps, teamed with our Navy brethren, we must be able to win the reconnaissance and counter-reconnaissance fight, knowing that our adversaries will take advantage of any large, slow, or massed formation. Speed and mobility, the attributes of any naval force, the attributes of, attributes of any fleet, uh, equate to survivability. And I reject the survivability binary, if anybody wants to talk about that. For the Marine Corps, the landing ship medium, the LSM, will give us an edge needed to operate uh, in a contested environment. The LSM will enable the Marine Corps and the Navy to rapidly distribute forces from the Marine littoral regiments and other adjacent units. They're not exclusive to any type model series of cargo or human uh, within the Indo-PACOM region to gain a further edge in that competition with the pacing challenge. But let's not overbake this thing. It's not an amphibious warship, and it shouldn't be. It's, it enables our ability to remain at the forward edge. It enables our forces to move, maneuver, and sustain in the littorals that are relevant to the fight. We don't need, you know, the cyber truck. Uh, we don't need a $3 billion sports car. We need a Ford F-150 with crank windows and, and maybe a cassette deck instead of an eight-track tape player, right? you know. But we need them at scale. 100% of nothing is zero. We need to have them at scale, and we need them to be available. Like Admiral Franchetti said and is fond of saying, we need more players on the field. I think we only need to look at the Ukrainians and what they have done in the Black Sea to gain insights and how they have been able to contain, pressurize, and push the Russian Black Sea Fleet, and in some cases, sink them, uh, to see the utility of littoral maritime maneuver elements teamed up with other elements uh, to have an impact on naval operations from our adversary. Highly mobile units in the littorals, armed with long-range precision fires, manned and unmanned systems in, in that particular fight have made an invaluable, and in some cases, decisive contribution to sea control and sea denial. We're rapidly gaining insights into littoral warfare from our friends, the Ukrainians, in the largest state-on-state -state conflict in Europe since World War II. So what's the right answer? The topic for this event is, do we have the right naval force structure to execute our nation's strategy? The answer is that we've identified some attributes of the right structure of the Navy Marine Corps team and ultimately the right naval force to support, once again, the Joint Force. We're working with the Department of the Navy on the plan to get there, but I again go back to the Secretary of the Navy's comments that this is a whole of government approach. It's an end-to-end -end approach. It's an enterprise approach, private sector, public sector approach. 
This summer, the Con Congressional Budget Office analysis of fiscal year 2024 shipbuilding plan concluded that each of the three alternatives presented uh, for shipbuilding would require appropriations that were 31 to 40 percent more than the average of the past years. Let that, let that wash over you. 31 to 40 percent greater than the last five years. That's a, that's a pretty big swing. They estimated that the total shipbuilding costs were 16 percent above estimates, and that's not even including O and M. What this tells me is the old PR guy, the old money guy, uh, it's not that the Navy is asking too much, but there's, in every case presented, there is a need for more resources. It's simple math. In every case, it won't be an overnight effort, but there are immediate and critical steps where we can gain ground. We can make simple, informed resource decisions to keep American shipbuilding lines open, strengthen them, two-year centers for LPD Flight 2, four-year centers for LHA class ships, and block buys that save hundreds of millions of dollars for the taxpayer and give a sense of uh, predictability for our friends that are building our ships. We can leverage our allies and partners, as mentioned, not just for shipbuilding, but to share in the maintenance efforts of our ships. I'm ready today uh, to start working with industry partners or whoever is interested to increase pathways for Marines seeking, once they exit, to go into the trades and serve uh, another way in the shipyards. What I would ask is that we prioritize our naval forces during these critical years and make critical investments while, there, while there's still time on the clock. As I mentioned earlier, you know, every cycle that goes by, every opportunity is bypassed for one reason or another. You're not going to get that back. You can't buy it back. Are we funding the department, the Department of the Navy, to a level that can compete with what Admiral Aquilino last week described as the largest military buildup in history since World War II at a speed that has not been matched since World War II? Can we compete? I think you have my answer, and I'll leave the rest of the answer to you. Thanks, and I'll, you can come back at me now. Thanks. Semper Fidelis. All right. Hey, sir, Don Klein from Thermahan, former P3 guy. Could you speak, two-part question real quick, unmanned systems versus legacy platforms? Where do you see, what, what do you see as a, you know, an approximate mix? Uh, the second thing is the Navy in particular has been dabbling in surf USVs and UUVs for quite a while, but there's not really a well-defined path to when it's actually become operational. So do we accept that we're going to take five to ten years to get the 100 percent solution, or do we invest in a solution that's 80 percent that we can have a year or two from now? Thanks very much. You bet. Uh, great, great question, and, it, and if you were at Reagan uh, last week, you would have had some very high-powered people be able to answer you in very, very deep technical terms. Unmanned versus manned. Uh, everybody remember those mimeograph machines that you went like, you know, with the blue thing on it, you went like this, and you could make 10 copies in a minute, and boy, wasn't that great because you didn't have to type them. The manned unmanned argument is over. The question is, to what scale and scope is there going to be a balance between humans in the loop, humans in the cockpit, and not? Because that mimeograph machine has now turned into a laser printer that can put out 500 pages a minute. That's, that's the speed, that, that is kind of what we're talking about here. Um, I'll go back to my U Ukrainian example. They're using rudimentary unmanned systems to have a, an effect that is well beyond the investment that they put in it. Why would you not do that? Now, the question is, who are the decision makers? What do we allow the machines to do? What do we tell them not to do? And that will be the argument going forward, whether it's an AI argument, whether it's a uh, large language model ar argument. But it's not, it's not as much pressure on unmanned systems as, as it is the lethality argument, and to use Admiral Aquilino's uh, kind of trilogy of blind, see, kill, 
there is huge upside in each of those categories for unmanned systems or uncrewed systems. Um, to the, so does that answer the first part of your question? Second part of the question is, and I'll put my PNR hat back on, uh, the labyrinthine, serpentine, byzantine, we ran out of time, cycle that we run in order to bring capabilities aboard. That has been recognized and in particular by uh, OSD and by the Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defense. So you've heard of programs like Replicator, uh, competitive uh, pathways, project convergence, project overmatch. These are designed to push through that to get around it. And I just my recent experience with Replicator, uh, the time frame is 18 months at scale. And there are very skilled vendors that are ready to come back to us. And a lot of those systems that are being entertained in the replicator effort uh, are, are unmanned or autonomous to some, to some degree. D does that get after that? So if the traditional pathway, you and I will be here 10 years from now going, hey, yeah, we'll get after it. But I think the DepSecDef sees that, that we need to push that sense of urgency and we need to push hard. And Re Replicator, in specifically, is one one example where we're getting after that. And and I, you know, let me. I'm too old, you know, to kind of blow smoke. We're going to see it. We're going to see results from that effort. Uh, very real results. And one of those three, see blind kill. And com my fourth one, which is command and control. Your aide's giving you the signal okay. right there. But he's junior to me. I have a quick. <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes, sir. So force structure without enough weapons is hollow. And certainly one of the lessons we learned from Ukraine is we need more weapons. Uh, are we making the right investments in the right weapons now to help support us during this Davis and win window of vulnerability? And is industry even capable of responding to the demand signal uh, on those weapons? Great, uh, great question. When I, well, the, the question was, first of all, I don't know if Admiral Davidson wants to take credit for that window. I call it the she window. He's the one that said it, so we might as well believe him. Hey, hey, fellas, be ready by 2027. Uh, at Reagan, one of the questions that was asked is, hey, what keeps you up all night? And there were all good things uh, that were brought up and all very uh, relevant subjects. When it, when it came to me, you know, not only because I was the last guy in line, hey, I got to say something that nobody else has said. Well, what, what wasn't said was magazine depth. And to your point, weapons magazine depth is an issue. Not only how much do we have, what can it do, but how can we, how, is it enough for the first salvo? What do we have left for the second salvo and how do we replace it? And essentially, I'm restating the question that you asked. I think that, that as much as the structure issue that I brought up here is an is a advocacy call. We've, we've got something as would seem as simple as 155 millimeter ammo. Uh, we've seen that go, go down uh, dramatically supporting our friends, the Ukrainians. What happens when we start whistling off very sophisticated weapons that take a long time to build? We've got to have the defense industrial base that can support that, but we've got to support the defense industrial base to get to that point. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. I, I may not be competent enough to answer that question directly, but I'll, I'll put it in terms of a recent visit down to the Gulf Coast and to the shipbuilders down there. My estimation, if they are a subset of industry, is that our industry in the United States can do anything on any timeline, reasonable or unreasonable, but they've got to be brought in They've got to have SA, they've got to have resources, and they've got to build out to do it. But I believe that they can. Let's not, once again, rule out our, our allies and partners. Significant capability, uh, not only in just capacity of building things, but in technological know-how. So if you put that whole thing together, I believe the answer is yes. But you've got to commit to it. You can't just say it, hey, there's the smartest guy in the world. The smartest guy or gal in the world has got to be able to do their job, and they've got to be able to be resourced to do it. That goes back to the process issue. Is that, is that get after it? Okay. All right, how about, how about one more? Uh, uh, I'm getting the hook from Ray. He's, I'm not senior to him. <laughs> well, yes, you are, sir. 
General, uh, we very much appreciate your time. We know you're new in the job, but you're not only new in the job, you're holding down two jobs right now. Uh, so we really appreciate you making the time for us. Sir, sure, thanks. Always a pleasure. As a token of our appreciation, we'd like you to have this Naval Institute Press book, uh, U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century by Brent Sadler. Awesome. Great. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it.